you don't come on in. Proverbs chapter 11, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 8. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. Father, we pray and ask now, Lord, for your blessings upon the Sunday school hour. Lord, again, I pray, help me, Lord, to teach. Guide my mind, Lord, as I speak, Lord, and follow the outline that you've given to me. Lord, uh, the scripture verses, the points that you've directed me to make. Lord, and let them be a blessing and an edification of my brothers and sisters in Christ here this morning. And we pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, verses 5 through 8, let's read them. <coughs> Come back to <coughs> verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but the but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. All right, back up to verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. What does it mean to be biblically perfect? We need to go over to Philippians chapter 3. For that, here we're going to find uh, Paul in this passage. Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Best place for us to look as though it presents an apparent contradiction, and there are no contradictions in the Scripture, it does give to us the understanding that we're looking for here in what is to be biblically perfect. So we'll pick it up at verse 12, Philippians chapter 3, in verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. The key to understanding what we just read here is will actually be in verses 10 and 11 here. We need that in this to understand what Paul is talking about here. It sets the context. So... Go back to verse 10 and 11. That I may know Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. It was the resurrection from the dead that brought to fruition everything which Jesus Christ had accomplished from Calvary up to that point. If Christ had not risen from the dead, then there would have been no salvation. There would have been no redemption. There would have been no justification, no propitiation of righteousness, no victory over death and hell. Yes, the, the holiness and righteousness of God would have been satisfied. The price would have been paid. But if he hadn't risen from the dead, then it all would have accomplished nothing. The resurrection from the dead was the necessary element, the completion to what had been begun and so made possible the fulfillment of the Trinity's eternal plan for humanity. As Christ said of himself, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Now, to be perfect in the context of both Philippians 3.12 and 3.15 means to be complete. Paul was, all of his life after his conversion, striving to attain the completion of the resurrected Christ. Now, he didn't, and we won't attain that until we too are changed at the blessed hope as Christ was at his resurrection. But we are to follow after as it says. We're to follow after it. We are to strive for it. We are to press towards that. That is to be our eventual end, and so that is to be our continual effort. No, we know, yeah, I'm not going to attain unto the fullness of what I will be as long as I'm in this mortal life. But we are expected to be striving towards that, to be pressing towards that, to be working towards that. And that's why he says there, I have, you know, am not yet perfect. Okay. But he was perfect in verse 15 in his attitude, in his heart, in his motive. He was complete in that, in his efforts of striving towards it. That's right. why, yeah, seems like an apparent contradiction, but you need to have the context of verses 10 and 11 to understand what he's saying, okay? You know, I, well, we'll talk about it a little bit in this morning's message. You know, I've begun the journey. Okay. And I'm in a process here in my mortal life of striving towards this eventual end. And that should be my eventual end. That should be all my desire. That should be all my hope. That should be everything that I want. Okay. I know I won't fully achieve it in this mortal life because I'm stuck in this mess right here. Which I hate. I tell my flesh all the time. I'll look in the mirror and I'll go, I hate you. I'll be glad to be rid of you. <laughs> Best thing you're going to do for me is die. I can get my glorified body. So I'm not yet perfect in that respect, but I am perfect in my mentality, in my motive, in my effort, in what I'm striving for. I'm perfect in my heart and in my desire because that's what I'm working towards. That's what I'm striving for. Not my salvation. That's secure. That's done. That's complete. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about achieving Christ likeness. I'm no different than anybody else. I fight and battle with it just like you all do. You know, we endeavor to get as close to it as is possible while still in this mortal life. One reason is because we have been, as it says there, apprehended of Christ. What were we apprehended for? That very purpose. That very end. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That we might be being conformed to the image of Christ until we come to that ultimate end. That's what we've been apprehended for. You know, the Lord's grabbed a hold of us. You know, with a specific purpose and a specific role for us to play, that we're here to fulfill within the body, within the church of Jesus Christ. And so Paul was striving to be apprehended for that for which he also had been apprehended of Christ Jesus. So, he said, okay, this is what I've been apprehended for, therefore I am going to try to apprehend that myself. Grab a hold of it. <laughs> Hang on to it. Make it mine. Okay? He's striving to fulfill his Holy Spirit appointed place within the body of Jesus Christ and fulfill the will of his head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Like I say, the context, verse 15, is a little bit different from what it 
is uh, in the first part of that because he's saying, you know, those of us that are perfect, okay, and it's about your motive, the mentality of the heart, and that's what relates to our verse back over in Proverbs 11. Let's turn back over there again. Proverbs 11, verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. Okay. It's talking about that perfection of the mind, the perfection of the heart, the perfection of the mentality, the perfection of one's motives towards striving to be all that God has called us to be and to do. And that's the context here of Proverbs 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. We're able to make a very clear sense of the verse with that. We are righteous. You know, we're righteous because we have obtained it according to God's prescribed manner for this dispensation, salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness because of his resurrection from the dead has been imputed to us. My righteousness is not my own. Thank God Almighty. Boy, would I be in trouble. <laughs> my righteousness is his righteousness. So therefore, you know, the righteousness of the perfect will direct his way. You know, our way being a sinner saved by grace, okay, again, is striving for Christ-likeness in our mortal lives, to honor and to glorify and to bring praise to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, what you just did out there in the parking lot, brother. That's, that's part of what that is. That's exactly what that is. That goes on, it says, But the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Now the wicked are exactly the opposite of the righteous. The wicked are their own worst enemy. They're forging their own chains. They're knotting their own noose. They're building their own prison. And they're stoking their own fire. And you, the righteous okay, and the perfect, are mean-spirited and judgmental and hypocritical for trying to warn them of it. <laughs> you know? Do it anyways. Do it anyways. Verse number six. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but the transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. The righteousness of the upright <coughs> shall deliver them. Well, again, our righteousness okay, is what is going to deliver us <laughs> from the wrath and judgment of God in the lake of fire. But again, our righteousness in this dispensation is not your own. And sorry. Uh, you can work at that all you want to in this life. Okay, You think you're going to be saved in this life by your good outweighing your bad. Uh, yeah, that's a truth in some other dispensation, but not in this one. The work's done. And the righteousness has been imputed unto you by putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. One is upright if one is righteous. To be upright is to be able to stand due to being righteous, irregardless of what pressure gets put upon you to stand forth in honesty, to stand forth in good character, to be morally right. Okay, an upright uh, you know, is a structural member. Uh, you know, this building has uprights within it. They're the load-bearing part of the structure. They're the ones that bear the weight and bear the pressure and keep everything standing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The upright are essential. 
in the church. They're the pillars that keep everything up and keep everything standing. You, know, you, you, you knock an upright out. <laughs> you know, all the others now are bearing more pressure and more weight. You knock another one, you know, and eventually it'll collapse. And sadly, of course, that is what is happening with the Church of Jesus Christ. You got fewer and fewer who are maintaining that uprightness in their lives. And so eventually, you know, when that time comes, there will be a total collapse of the Church of Jesus Christ, just as he comes to take the church out. That is sadly the reality and truth of this Laodicean period. You know, we know where we are in time. We understand where we are in time. We may not like it. We shouldn't. Uh, but it is the reality and the fact of where we are. But transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. A transgressor is one who violates authority and violates laws. That's what a transgressor is. And as a law enforcement officer, I dealt with a lot of transgressors. <laughs> you know, I knew what the laws were and then what were the requirements were and so forth. And when I came across, had to deal with somebody who was violating them, then I dealt with them appropriately. Go over to Romans chapter 3 with me. Pick it up verse 9. Romans chapter 3. And we want to look at verse 9. And we'll go down to verse 18. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a condition of every human being that's born into the world. And unless and until they put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ or, and be born again, that is going to be their condition at death. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And that's the fact of it. Uh, you know, no amount of self-reformation, uh, attempts at self-improvement, none of those things are going to accomplish what God requires for us to have the righteousness to stand before Him. Verse number 7. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. Mortal death seals one's eternal condition of existence. Once the mortal body dies, the condition of your soul will be its condition for all eternity. There's no do-overs. There's no let's go back and try again. There's no second chance after mortal death. Only two possible conditions of eternal existence given in the scriptures, a living soul or a dead soul. That's it. Those are the only two options given in the Bible. All men are born as dead souls due to Adam's fall in the garden. All men are therefore wicked by biblical definition. Again, we just read over there in Romans chapter 3. God's description of the human race. <laughs> what God has to say is the condition of man 
outside of him. People won't like it, but them's the facts. <laughs> That's the truth. That is the reality of things. Okay, You don't get to set your own standard. You don't get to decide what's good and what's evil. You don't get to decide what's righteous and what's wicked. God's already set the standard. And He established it completely with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the resurrection from the dead. Not of the dead, from the dead. <laughs> okay. He left the dead behind. And they're still there in hell. Okay. And if you're not born again, and so become a living soul, then when your mortal body expires, and it will, then you will be forever, for all eternity, a dead soul. And there's only one location for eternally dead souls. And right now, it's a holding cell called hell. After the great white throne judgment, it's going to be the eternal lake of fire. The wicked man's expectation perisheth with mortal death because he cannot escape any longer the truth and the reality of hell. All right, up until that point of sure death, men will lie into them, to themselves and deceive themselves and try to believe and grasp at any possible thing. But when they know they're about to breathe their last, that reality comes crushing in on them with a horror that we can't imagine. And this is because they are unjust. Unjust men place their hopes of eternal life in themselves and their own wicked imagination. Self-righteousness, religion, being a good person as men count goodness, keeping the golden rule, and so on and so forth. But that all perishes. As soon as they die, they lift up their eyes in hell. Just as the rich man did in Luke chapter 16. All right, verse number 8. The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. People are saying, well, if that's so, how come? <laughs> right? The righteous is delivered out of trouble. You know, and, well, Job 5, 7. You know, yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. And boy, are we. Now, if you've never experienced any trouble in your life, <laughs> you are either incredibly unusual <laughs> or you're lying to yourself. Being saved is not a deliverance from trouble in our mortal lives because of the curse. That's not what it's talking about here. Uh, you need to go over Revelation 21, the last book of our Bible, next to the last chapter. Revelation 21. Here we want to look at verses 3, 4, and 5. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now we will be delivered into a troubleless, peaceful, eternally blessed existence. That is where we're heading. Kathy and I were talking the other night you know, about 
the curse you know, in the millennium reign. You know, is the curse completely lifted in the world? No, it's not. It's lifted for the most part over nature, over the earth, but not from men. Uh, even during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ here on the earth, okay, men are still wicked, men are still sinners, men are still capable of doing wrong. There's still going to be sickness, there's still going to be death, there's still going to be fighting, there's still going to be murders, all these things. The, the earth, who was not guilty of the cause of the curse, has the curse lifted from it. We read about the lion laying down with the lamb and the little children leading the bear and the, and the tiger and sitting on you know, the, the cockatrice den and, and these sorts of things. Uh, but even, in, I think, in nature, in, in its entirety, it's not completely gone. I don't believe that the curse in itself is completely gone until God creates a new heaven and a new earth, when the process is completed. But it says, And the wicked cometh in his stead. Now, though it may not occur in this life, and we see that, and we scratch our heads, and we wonder why, Okay. But the wicked will eventually <coughs> and eternally reap nothing but trouble and anguish and sorrow and torment and suffering. And the sad and terrible truth behind that is that it simply does not have to be. It doesn't have to be. No man when he dies, goes to hell because God chose him to go to hell or God sends him. He goes there because of choices he made in this life. God has made a means from Adam right down to today. Within every dispensation of God, there's been a means of being able to be righteous before God. The Old Testament saints, faith and works. And they had to wait for their sins to be paid for. They had to wait for the Christ of God to come and to make that payment for them. And he did. And he rose from the dead. And the price has been paid. And during this wonderful dispensation of the grace of God, during the church aid, salvation couldn't be easier, couldn't be simpler. Believe what God has said. Put your trust and faith in that and accept the free gift of salvation and be born again. I mean, what, what an incredible blessing. You know, like I said, we're, we're, we're the only group, if you will, to which that's been given. We are going to be unique, the body of Christ. You know, and that's what makes it so horribly sad when a person dies in their sins having rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ because it just simply didn't have to be. And won't be to them at the great white throne of judgment because that's God's question to them is why? Why would you not take my son as your Savior? Alright, we're going to stop there for this morning. Any questions for me at all? Here we go with verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, Proverbs chapter 11. Comments, anything that you would like me to repeat for you? All right, we'll stop.